the instruments in, the, in my little museum, I built everything. None of them came from plans or kits. I uh, would take a, like a medieval painting or something like that, measure from the wrist bone to the elbow bone, and you get a pretty good idea by doing math how big the instrument is, and it gives you a close idea. Just don't ask me to balance a checkbook, but I can make just about anything I can see, and I'm not even sure why. I built all of the instruments in here. There aren't any plans that I know of that you can buy to do this, so most of it is done from historical paintings and that sort of thing. Okay, this is represents the oldest thing that I've recreated. They found ouds in Pharaoh's tombs 2,000 years before Christ. They brought the oud back to Europe and that's when it, they put frets on it and turned it into a lute. This is basically the grandfather of the lute, which is the grandfather of the guitar. A lot of them were made from gourds, and that's why they have the big bulbous body. Okay, this is the lute. It's a descendant of the oud, which made its way into the Euro European society around the time of the Crusades, and uh, Crusaders brought it back from the Middle East. This one's made of curly maple. This is curly maple, and then the Purfling in between is uh, there's a strip of uh, ebony, a strip of holly, and then another strip of ebony. Very, very, very thin. The neck is decorated uh, with a, just a medieval design. Completely symmetrical like this. The clamps like this. And then you just take a machete or something like that, and then you glue them together. And Mark, we get about 17 of these glued together. You glue them onto here. The first one ever came to Canada. The custom customs stopped it. They thought it was a weapon. I have a Theorbo that I made in my shop a couple of years ago and it's a little weird looking because basically it is a bass lute. The reason it is so long is because they wanted the really low notes but you can't, when you're limited to gut strings, you can't just make them larger to get a deeper sound, they go dead. So they had to go longer and so this is actually a short one but this is a French lute from the 15, 1600s, and uh, it's called a Theorbo. This is the vihuela in Shakespeare's time if you went to buy a guitar at the music shop or a luthier. I suppose they didn't have music shops anyway. It would look something like this. This is a fluted back vihuela. Uh, we don't, I don't know why they do the, the fluted back. It's very difficult to make. 
by the time I was done, I made a lot of kindling. This is a very small instrument, but it has a very good sound. And I'm thinking it's because there's no rebracing required because of the strength of this, uh, the flutes. If, if this was completely authentic, it would only have five courses and it would probably be double string. But I made this one just like a regular guitar, so anybody who plays a guitar can pick it up and play it quite comfortably. I, I just built them. Who said I could play them? <laughs> Uh, my theory is that it came from China when the Mongols were raiding back and forth between China and Russia. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese instrument with two strings and I believe that it came from that. One of the weird things is the first two strings are the same. It has four. These two are the same. These two are the same. No, I've built more than I can play, finally. My ability to build them has outdone my ability to play them. <laughs> Very badly done. <laughs> okay, this is the giant psaltery. It's a relatively new instrument. I think they start bowing it in the 1800s. And uh, this is a smaller bowed psaltery, which would be about the same time. But the psaltery goes all the way back to the Bible. And it looks something like this. It might have a double cutaway like this. And they'd hold it in their arms like that and pluck it as poetry is being read. And this sort of thing. But the giant psaltery, even though it sounds like it's right out of the Middle Ages, I'm afraid it's only about the early 1800s. When it was actually born. This is the Fitzgerald Kildare Harp from the 17th century. It's an Irish harp. It's a member of the Clarsac family. The Clarsacs are uh, Celtic harps that are all strung with wire, uh, opposed to silk or gut strings, which was typical of that period. They're strung with brass wire. They could be gold, silver, bronze, or brass. And sometimes they actually used iron, but they sound like a bell as opposed to the more modern harps that have a little more of a plunky sound. I just fell in love with the Irish harp. They just keep appearing, kind of like rabbits. <laughs> this is the organistrum. It was invented by uh, monks in the Basque area of France and Spain. There's some stone carvings on a church called Puerto de Glory. It's on the El Camino Trail. It goes from Poland to Madrid. None have survived from uh, antiquity. It's the only thing we have are pictures. So I, this is built from the, looking at the pictures of that. And it has three strings. Uh, it plays chords. And uh, they used it to uh, mostly accompany Gregorian music. This is the hurdy-gurdy, and it is the grandchild of the organistry. It evolved uh, from the 1100 and all the way up until even the 1800s. They were still using and making hurdy-gurdies in Europe. In fact, there's a renaissance and they're making them now. 
this is the Baroni Hurdy Gurdy because a famous artist who did a lot of pictographs, his name is Baroni, and uh, he's depicted some what you call a hurdy gurdy man. They would go from village to village, announce that the hurdy gurdy man was in town. People would come listen to the music. You could maybe even dance and that sort of thing, but it'd be quite the event. You know, realizing that in the Middle Ages, uh, there was no music, there was nothing. If you weren't singing or playing an instrument, there was silence. So when somebody could actually play an instrument and showed up playing it, people would stop what they're doing and take a look. It, uh, it's a fairly interesting instrument. You turn a crank, the crank rubs against a, a string, which makes a sound, and you shorten the sounds and change the pitches by pushing the keys. The hurdy-gurdy is just a really neat instrument and it, it's something that as I'm making my last instrument I'm always figuring out what my next project will be and that was next. Music most of my life was not a big deal until I heard a medieval and Renaissance group. I went to a concert of the Troubadours, which is a women's group, and it just moved me, and I wanted to get a lute. You can't really buy one, so I figured out how to make it. That was so much fun that I just kept going. I, for some reason, have the ability to create 3D plans in my head and once in a while I have to put it on paper and I actually keep a record of it but most of the furniture, the instruments and that sort of thing I just built. There, were, there really wasn't any plans. For some reason I've had the ability to do that. <laughs>